Well, good day, everybody. Uh, Noor Niandu from uh, Mount and Jerry country. Um, my name is Paul Worley. I'm the Executive Director for uh, Clinical Innovation here in the Riverland Valley Coorong Local Health Network, and uh, welcome to our uh, grand round. Uh, today, we uh, have a presentation from uh, Dr. James Mukey, who, uh, as a former Australian of the Year, was uh, responsible for raising the consciousness of our country to uh, an epidemic that uh, uh, is uh, not the uh, the pandemic, uh, but one that is uh, potentially causing even more damage uh, to our country. Um, so welcome, James. Uh, welcome and uh, look forward to your uh, presentation, Blinded by Science. Thank you so much, Paul, and, and thanks to the Riverland GPs for joining in today. I'll, I'll literally drive, drive straight into it. So let me share my screen and hopefully that all works. OK, so um, thank you so much. And uh, uh, you may well be wondering why an ophthalmologist such as myself has delved into the world of type 2 diabetes. Well, I always saw myself at the guy, as the guy at the end of the line treating the end stage complications, the blinding complications of what is a largely man-made uh, avoidable dietary disease. Uh, so things for me took a turn in 2018 when I met this guy. His name's Neil Hansel. Uh, he's an everyday Aussie bloke with a wife and four kids. Uh, he constructs light machinery for a living and he also has type 2 diabetes. And a few years ago, diabetes changed Neil's world forever. Unfortunately, as a child, he neglected his health. He developed type 2 diabetes at the age of 26 and then went on to neglect his diabetes and he paid a very big price. He went to bed one evening with normal sight and woke up the next morning blind in both eyes. One of my colleagues worked really hard to try and turn this around, but unfortunately it was too late. Neil was to spend the rest of his life in darkness. Neil lost his driving license, he lost his independence, and he lost his ability to teach the javelin, which is his hobby. Actually, it was more than a hobby, it was a passion that gave him a huge amount of joy. But the thing that upsets Neil more than anything is that he can no longer see the beautiful smiles and the faces of his wife and his grandkids. This is a picture of Neil's wife and two of his grandkids. This is how he should see them, and this is the reality Neil has been irreversibly blinded by his type 2 diabetes. And Neil's not alone. He's just one of over 100,000 Aussies with sight-threatening eye disease due to their diabetes. So how does diabetes threat sight? Well, as you know, diabetes damages the blood vessels throughout the, uh, throughout the body, including the retina. This is a picture of the central vision area of the retina in a patient with type 2, uh, the macula. And here's that same eye. Short time later, Diabetes can cause bleeding inside the eyes uh, in an instant, and sometimes, as in Neil's case, permanently. The important point here is that nearly all of the loss of vision and blindness due to diabetes is preventable or treatable, something in the order of 98%. But to avoid the blinding com complications of this disease, patients with diabetes need to have their eyes checked on a regular basis. In Australia, however, of the 1.7 plus million with diabetes, well over half are not having their regular, all-important sight-saving eye checks. That's why it's now become the leading cause of blindness amongst working age adults in this country. It's also the fastest growing cause of vision loss uh, in Aboriginal people. So for myself, as an eye specialist, to see people go needlessly blind due to this disease, it makes me upset. But the thing that makes me really angry is that this disease should not be happening at all. Type 2 diabetes was rare in the 60s. These days in Australia, we're seeing about 250 new cases being diagnosed every single day. It amounts to about 100,000 cases every year in this country. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about type 2 diabetes, how it's arisen, why it's a growing epidemic, and we're going to look at a strategy to help turn this, uh, this serious threat to our health system and to our society. So in my introduction, I mentioned that it's a largely avoidable man-made dietary disease. What did I mean by that? Well, three key elements, sugar, fine carbohydrates, and the seed oil. So let's have a look at these each in turn. So firstly, sugar. When we talk about sugar, we often think of table sugar, what we stir in our tea and coffee. It's important to remember there's another very abundant form of sugar, 
and that is the refined carbohydrates, products such as highly refined white flour and white rice and peeled white potatoes and the foods prepared from these. These are all virtually pure starch, and starch are simply long chains of glucose molecules which are broken down into single gl glucose molecules as soon as they reach their gut. Uh, in fact, it's a process that begins as soon as it enters the mouth. And it's really important it's to be aware. Here. So I think is someone talking to me. No, no. If we could just turn off the microphone, thanks. So it's really important to be aware uh, that sugar and refined carbohydrates, are nutrient poor, non-essential. It's actually not a single biochemical process in our body that demands we ingest them. For me, this was second year biochemistry and the Krebs cycle, which some of you might remember. Uh, we can actually obtain all the energy we need from the protein and healthy fats in our diet. And yet, our Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, which is based on our Australian Dietary Guidelines, is packed with products made from refined carbohydrates. Uh, there are also products there uh, which have a relatively large amount of sugar. So how can this be truly considered a guide to healthy eating? So let's go back to sugar. So table sugar, sucrose, this is made up of 50% glucose and 50% fructose. And the body handles these two elements in completely different ways. So let's look at them each in turn. Firstly, glucose. And glucose is absorbed uh, into the bloodstream from the gut. It triggers the re release of the hormone insulin uh, from the pancreas. And that insulin helps move the glucose into every cell of our body where it's either stored or used as an energy source. When I talk about glucose metabolism, I like to use uh, Jason Fung's analogy of a subway train in Tokyo with a train car is the cell, uh, the glucose molecules are the passengers and the insulin is the conductor. With prolonged and excessive intake of sugar and refined carbohydrates, the cell starts to fill up with glucose. to help push more glucose into the cell but it reaches a stage where it can't push any more in. We are now resistant to the effects of insulin. We've become what's known as insulin resistant. And so there's an overflow of glucose back into the bloodstream. This is taken up by the liver, converted into glycogen, but the glycogen stores uh, are limited. So the liver then starts turning the glucose into fat, which is actually exported away to healthy fat cells throughout the body. It's actually a type of protective mechanism but when the production of fat uh, by the liver outstrips its ability to be exported away, the liver then starts to take on that fat and we develop what's known as a fatty liver. Now you're all aware of what a healthy liver looks like, right? It's a, a deep red color. And this is a picture of a fatty liver. It's yellow because it's absolutely suffused with fat. Now a great example of a fatty liver comes from the French culinary delicacy, foie, which actually means fat liver. Is created by force feeding ducks refined carbohydrates in the form of high starch cornmeal. And these unsuspecting creatures, a fatty liver can develop in as little as 10 days. In humans with excessive fructose intake, a fatty liver can develop in two months. It's that 50% of table sugar that gives sugary products their sweet flavour. It's not recognized as a food by the body. It doesn't trigger the release of insulin. And it actually suppresses our appetite control system. And when it's absorbed into the bloodstream, majority is taken up by the liver and about a third is converted immediately to fat. So it's actually far more toxic than glucose in giving rise to a fatty liver. Now, the third element I mentioned uh, were the seed oils, what we euphemistically call vegetable oils, canola, sunflower, safflower, for example. These industrially produced oils are rich in omega-6 fatty acids, uh, which are in inflammogenic, and they actually oxidize in the bottle. Uh, they oxidize even more when we're cooking, and also uh, when they get into the bloodstream. And linoleic acid is the uh, particularly bad one. When this is oxidized and taken up by the mitochondria, it gives rise to mitochondrial dysfunction and independently can cause insulin resistance and a fatty liver. So these three components, sugar, refined carbohydrates, and the seed oils are the major elements of ultra processed foods, or what I prefer to call ultra processed food-like substances. They are unhealthy substances, which have been linked to a number of chronic diseases, including type two diabetes. They're like a loaded gun pointing directly at our livers, causing metabolic dysfunction. 
They now make up 62% of the calories of the US diet, over 50% of the UK diet, and I suspect we're nudging close to 50% of our own diet. So this is a cross section through a normal healthy liver. You can see the densely packed cells. The fatty liver is distended. And you can see those white spaces of the cells which are filled with fat. Now it takes on average 13 years to develop type 2 diabetes after we become insulin resistant. In kids, however, it can happen in as little as two years. And it's a complex metabolic process that also includes pancreatic dysfunction due to fatty infiltration. And there are three main metabolic dysfunctions that uh, are caused uh, by high glucose, which can then trigger a high insulin response, high blood fructose, and the high level of oxidized omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids in the blood. So let's look at these each in turn, and, and excuse me while we delve into a bit of biochemistry and pathophysiology. So hyperglycemia has two main impacts. Uh, glycation of the apoprotein B moiety on the surface of low density lipoprotein. This can trigger atherogenesis and consequent, uh, consequently ischemia. Main impact is endothelial glycocalyx damage, which can result in vascular leakiness. We'll come back to those two uh, in a moment. Uh, hyperinsulinemia uh, triggers retention of sodium, which is what gives rise to the hypertension that we see in patients with metabolic dysfunction. And there are a number of other really unpleasant side effects, which we'll look at a little bit later in the presentation. High blood fructose level is even more uh, glycating, up to 10 times more than glucose, and it also contributes to hypertension as uric acid is one of its metabolic byproducts. And the final thing was the uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which can also cause damage to the apoprotein B moiety through oxidation, compounding the atherogenesis, and also the ischemia. So let's look at lipoproteins. Uh, when fats uh, are uh, taken up by the liver, they are packaged up as very low density lipoproteins. They travel around the body, giving off triglycerides to skeletal muscle tissue, to fatty tissue and to other tissues, becoming uh, low density lipoproteins in the process. And those LDL particles then go back to the liver, cycle back to the liver, and the process starts again. Uh, fats are not soluble in the bloodstream, so this is a very elegant way of dealing with fat uh, in our diet. And this is, gives rise to what we call pattern A, we do a low density sorry, an LDL subparticle uh, fractionation. And these are what are known as the large, buoyant or fluffy particles. And these actually have a low cardiovascular risk. If the apoprotein B moiety is damaged by glycation or oxidation, it is no longer recognized by the liver. It stays in the blood system longer. Particles become smaller and denser and dense are giving rise to the B pattern, the small dense particles. And these have a high cardiovascular risk. Why do they have a high cardiovascular risk? Because although they're not recognized by the liver anymore, they are recognized by macrophages uh, in the blood vessel walls, taken up by the macrophages, giving rise to foamy cells. And this triggers subendothelial inflammation, plaque formation and resulting ischemia. It's not LDL per se that's the bad fat, it's actually the small dense particles which are the bad fat. So if you're worried about a patient who has raised uh, total cholesterol or LDL, I would certainly consider lipid subfraction analysis, and coronary, coronary artery calcium scores. And this is just a picture of the uh, lipid subfraction analysis for a patient with particles one and two. This is a, uh, the uh, low cardiovascular risk. Uh, Triglyceride is an excellent proxy for small dense LDL particles. If the level is less than one, highly unlikely to have SDL particles. If it's so, we have a low cardiovascular risk, but if it's over 1.5, which is actually about 40% of the population, then they're highly likely to have small dense LDL particles with a high cardiovascular risk. Second element is what I mentioned, the damage to the endothelial glycocalyx due to the high glucose level in the blood. And uh, the glycocalyx is actually the largest organ in the body, it covers about 7,000 square meters. It's metabolically very active, but it's also quite fragile. And we know that high blood glucose level causes damage to it. Uh, in patients with diabetes, 
the thickness is about half normal give rise to leakage from those blood vessels. And this leakage happens everywhere in the body because glucose is actually dissolved in the bloodstream. But in ophthalmology, we have the great privilege of being able to see inside the eye. We can see the retinal ischemia due to atherogenic uh, dyslipidemia, giving rise to retinal new blood vessels and vitreous hemorrhage, which is one of the major blinding complications. And we can see uh, the effects of retinal vascular permeability causing leakage from the capillaries and diabetic macular edema, uh, the most common cause of vision loss in patients with diabetes. Now, if we take a cross section through this macula by its side, cross section of the retina using the OCT, all those bubbly uh, spaces, are edema which is collecting in the retinal tissue of the macula. And quite often we need to inject an antibody, anti-VEGF antibody into the vitreous cavity, and this helps to seal up the leaky blood vessels, allowing the fluid to reabsorb. And you can see here just after one injection, a significant reduction in the edema in this patient's macula. Let's see how many injections we're giving for diabetic macular edema. We started using them back in 2016, and now uh, in, into 2022, I suspect we are well over 130,000 injections. So this mirrors the rise in type 2 diabetes in our society, uh, but it also is over 130,000 injections that we should not be giving at all. Um, to me, the, although uh, loss of vision is the most feared complication. To me, the most feared complication is, is dementia due to damage to the fine blood vessels of the brains. About 70% of patients will develop dementia. Having lost a father to dementia, this is a, a complication which I think is terribly, uh, terribly frightening and also impacts broadly on the entire family. Renal failure due to damage to the kidneys. Um, we are now seeing in Australia every year about four and a half million hours spent by patients with type 2 hooked up to the dialysis machine. So this is time lost to family, friends, uh, their loved ones, the things they like to do, and of course to their workplace. Damage to the major blood vessels can have catastrophic effects. Uh, gangrene is the second most feared complication. About 4,000 plus amputations performed for gangrene due to type 2 every year in this country. And here's our friend Neil Hansel in his hospital bed a couple of years ago after his left leg was amputated. In fact, it was his ninth amputation over a 14 month period. Niels also had two heart attacks. Uh, so this is also, of course, a deadly disease. About 80% patients will succumb to a thrombotic complication such as heart attack or stroke. It's said now to be the sixth biggest killer in our society. But if you factor in uh, its impact on the three major killers, heart attack, stroke, dementia, I suspect it's actually the biggest killer in our midst. And uh, if we have uncontrolled diabetes, you're 12 times more likely to uh, uh, succumb to the uh, very nasty side effects of, uh, of COVID-19 infection. In fact, 40% of the deaths in the United States were in patients with uh, type 2 diabetes. And I suspect many of the rest of them would have been insulin resistant because we know 93% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy these days. Also an incredibly expensive disease, costing our health system at least $20 billion every year. But if you factor in those other, th other three diseases, as well as its role in cancer and hypertension, then I suspect it's many fold higher, probably even approaching $100 billion every year. So how did this all come about? Well, humans are hardwired to love and seek out sweet things. It's an ancient survival mechanism that helped our early ancestors to survive extended periods of fasting, which were common in early humans. Prior to the 1600s, sugar was an expensive commodity. It was the domain of healers and holy men and an indulgence that could only be afforded by the wealthy and the powerful. Over the next 300 years, the rising availability and popularity of sugar led to diminishing costs, turning sugar from a luxury item to an everyday necessity. In these days, sugar is cheap and absolutely everywhere in our lives, isn't it? But things took a turn for the worse throughout the 20th century when we saw this rise in heart attacks. And it was thought that this was due to a fatty diet causing fatty blockage of the coronary arteries. It was called the diet heart uh, hypothesis, and it was championed by this guy, Dr. Ansel Keyes. Six country studies performed in 1953. His study 
show that there was a, a rise in heart attacks uh, related to the rise in fat consumption in six different countries. But what he failed to show was that there was data available from another 16 countries. And if we actually threw all of those countries in the mix, you will see that there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. But this, he was a very persuasive character and there was uh, corruption involved here as well as the flawed science. The sugar industry got on board and this became uh, absolute dogma. Uh, so, in fact, we have well and truly been blinded by science, or more to the point, we have been blinded by non-science. And this OFAT recommendation was taken up by the American uh, Dietary Guidelines in 1980, which recommended reducing our fat consumption to 30%. And when you take fat out of food, you take away its uh, flavour and you take away its ability to make you feel satisfied. So something had to replace that. Rates, we recommended to increase our starch consumption to 60%. And this low fat, high carb dietary recommendation exists to this day across the globe and in our own Australian dietary guidelines, which have an even more uh, a low fat, high carb recommendation. And we have obeyed. We've actually uh, eaten less red meat. We've actually eaten less dairy. And what's been the result of this social experiment? Well, rather than see a downturn in heart attacks, heart attacks have actually soared, along with it, type 2 diabetes, which has risen fourfold globally since 1980. And you can see the inexorable rise in type 2 diabetes uh, in recent years in Australia. But it's been much more profound in some countries and communities. In the Aboriginal people of this country, uh, we have seen more than 80 fold increase in type 2 diabetes over the past 40, 50 years. And I have no doubt uh, that their uh, exposure to the modern diet of sugary drinks and ultra processed foods is driving this uh, catastrophe in our First Nations people. And if you look at the uh, Guide for Healthy Eating for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, there's no doubt that this is not good food for diabetes, people who are carbohydrate intolerant. You can see um, the chart on the right hand side shows uh, a number of products made from refined carbohydrates as well as a number of ultra processed products here. So certainly not good food uh, to be healthy and strong. It's far removed from their ancestral diet. Type 2 diabetes is impacting on people from lower socioeconomic areas. Greater Western Sydney is one example. Uh, in this area, you can see the red area is the area of the highest prevalence. 50% uh, of the adults over the age of 24 have either pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. So for the first time in our history, we are overfed but undernourished. This is also a disease that's now impacting on children. When I was in medical school, type 2 diabetes was known as maturity onset diabetes. Well, guess what? We're now seeing it in kids as young as three. Australia, Northern Australia, leads the world for type 2 diabetes in young people. Not something we should be proud of, right? And it's been predicted that the majority of today's children will have obesity at the age of 35 if we don't take action now, in particular if we don't take action to reduce the consumption of sugary drinks, ultra processed foods, ultimately reduce our sugar intake. Now, if we're going to call this a dietary disease, there should be a dietary approach. It should be as simple as doing this. However, there are a number of factors which make this more difficult to achieve. And I've come up with this concept that I called the five A's of sugar toxicity, addition, alleviation, accessibility, addition, and advertising. So we'll go through these each in turn. So first, Sugar is highly addictive. It's been shown to be as addictive as nicotine. This consumption activates the reward center in our brains, leading to the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. What makes us feel good? It's what makes us want to do it again? And it's ultimately what gives us those cravings. And like drugs, the more we consume, the more we need to give us that feel good kick. So it becomes a vicious cycle that's really hard to break. It's alleviation. We often use sugar to alleviate stress or to make us feel better when we're down. When we're stressed, the body is flooded with the stress hormone cortisol and the brain needs to balance this up by releasing field group chemicals such as dopamine. And as I've shown you, uh, sugar does a really good job of that. Third A is accessibility. Sugar is everywhere in our lives. As a, we can't walk into most service stations without being confronted by a wall of confectionery. You can't check out from most supermarket sto stores uh, post offices, even 
stays without being uh, enticed by half priced chocolates and soft drinks. Particularly problematic in remote communities, especially Aboriginal communities, where sugary drinks, ultra processed foods, are in abundance, fresh and healthy foods are scarce, are relatively expensive, and sometimes even out of date. Fourth A addition something like 5% of our food and drinks have added sugar. I don't know about you, uh, but I can barely read those nutritional labels on the packet of foods, uh, let alone understand them. And they certainly don't tell us the amount of added sugar contained within. We have a health star rating system. It's a system that's flawed. It's flawed because only about 30% of manufacturers use it at this stage. But it's also flawed because a number of ultra processed products get a healthy five star rating. So this is a industry device that has been designed for by industry for industry, not with our health in mind. Final A is advertising. Our world is flooded with ads and TV commercials for sugary products, sometimes in the most insidious of ways. And this has been going on quite literally for decades. We clearly need action, right? And I've come up with action strategies of awareness, accountability and assistance. And today, just to keep it simple, I'm really just going to go through this first uh, strategy of awareness. We need to be aware of the toxic impact of our sugar laden diet, preventability, reversibility and complications of type 2 diabetes. Now, over 8000 studies linking sugar to a range of chronic diseases, particularly type 2 diabetes. How much is too much? Well, at any one time, there's about a teaspoon of sugar in the bloodstream, four grams, five millimoles per litre. And any more than what that one teaspoon actually provokes a physiological response that's harmful to the body. What is that harmful response? The release of insulin from the pancreas. And insulin is not a nice hormone. It's important, but it also augments fat storage. And most of you will be aware that patients, as soon as they go on insulin, put on weight. It's thrombogenic. It's inflammogenic, it impairs vitamin, vitamin D production. So uh, it's important um, in terms of, uh, which is really important to fight off infections such as COVID. It's also tumorogenic. So we should be trying to keep uh, insulin level, I mean, endogenous insulin level at a minimum, aiming for a fasting blood insulin level of less than five. In other words, we should be aiming for insulin sensitivity rather than insulin resistance. We need to be aware that our poor diet is responsible for more disease and death than tobacco, alcohol and inactivity combined. We cannot outrun a bad diet. And this awareness needs to begin in the earliest of years, in preschool, even earlier during pregnancy due to the rise of gestational diabetes. We need to be aware of the toxic impact of sugar component. I suspect much of the world is addicted to sugar. I certainly was and probably still am. Now, this was my favourite ice cream. And there was rarely a night uh, that I didn't have a bowl of ice cream after dinner. But I found out a couple of years ago that I had a fatty liver. And for those of you who've seen me, uh, there's a picture of my fatty liver. But if you've seen me, I'm tall and thin, six foot four. Uh, and I was tall and thin two years ago when this uh, ultrasound was taken of my liver. So I'm what they call toffee, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Now, there are more thin metabolically unhealthy people in the United States than there are obese metabolically unhealthy people. So this is not about obesity. It's not even about the numbers of calories that we're consuming. It's about the type of calories, but particularly the fructose and the seed oil elements that we're consuming in abundance. So many of us will be aware that type 2 diabetes is largely preventable, but it's not going to start with this high carbohydrate recommendation that is still prevalent in our dietary guidelines. And these dietary guidelines are very powerful. They're used broadly to inform what's eaten in childcare, schools, boarding houses, aged care, hospitals, defence force, and prisons. They also inform our army of health providers and health educators, as well as government policymakers and the food industry. They're being biased by industry and their making, and they're flawed. 
They're flawed because they continue to encourage the consumption of margarines and seed oils, which I've told you are unhealthy for us, and there's a number of references. But the guidelines also continue to discourage the eating of natural saturated fats as found in these products here. And yet, whole fat dairy, unprocessed meat, eggs, dark chocolate are not associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This is a systematic review released by the American Journal, uh, sorry, the American College of Cardiology's journal a couple of years ago. This was an organization which had previously been very anti-saturated fat. In fact, none of the four Cochrane reviews have ever found any reason uh, to vilify uh, natural saturated fat as a cause to cardiovascular disease. And for those of you who do eat meat, particularly red meat, uh, the Annals of Inter Internal Medicine in 2019 concluded that there's no evidence to make public health recommendations to limit red and unprocessed meat. Quite simply, if we want to avoid type 2 diabetes, we should avoid sugary drinks, refined carbohydrates, seed oils, and ultra-processed foods. In other words, just eat real food. A couple of other uh, tips which I find very useful. Uh, I do an intermittent fast every day, which for me just means not eating breakfast. And when you do an intermittent fast, your insulin level uh, plummets and you get mobilization of fat from the stores in the body. Resistance training to build up those muscles so that they can act as a sink for triglycerides in the system. Get a good night's sleep and get out to nature, particularly that early morning sun. And that will also help in your fight against metabolic dysfunction. Now, type 2 diabetes is potentially reversible. This was something that I wasn't aware about until recently. Even Diabetes Australia until early last year, the very first pay, a first sentence on their type 2 diabetes web pages that type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition. I read Jason Fung's The Diabetes Code. I'd highly recommend this. And I found out that you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. This was a revelation to me. And then two years later, I was able to get remission of type 2 diabetes into our national diabetes strategy for the very first time. Ah, uh, the three clinically proven methods for putting type 2 diabetes into remission, bariatric surgery, very low calorie diets, and low carbohydrate diets. So let's briefly look at each of these in turn. So bariatric surgery entails a variety of major abdominal procedures that are both risky uh, and costly on a normal healthy organ. So surely we should take a dietary approach to what is a dietary disease. And fortunately, there are two dietary approaches, very low calorie or very low energy diets and low carbohydrate diets. Very low calorie diets, uh, 800 calorie a day starvation diets. They're neither enjoyable, sustainable, and they rely on uh, nutrient poor ultra processed foods like you can see here. So I'm a fan of low carbohydrate diets, and there are now over 100 controlled clinical trials to show that they work both to prevent and reverse type 2 diabetes. And here's just one showing uh, that half, over half, are still in remission after two years. And we now have results out to five years showing that uh, half are still in remission. And they also reverse metabolic syndrome in half of the patients in 21 to 28 days. This is staggering. You can actually turn someone's metabolic dysfunction around within a month. They also allow the pancreases to recover. recover. And for those of you who want to avoid the diet wars, then we have a range of dietary approaches, which also includes vegetarian that have been, uh, we can use to uh, turn type 2 diabetes around. How about my own patients? Well, realized that you could actually put type 2 diabetes into remission. I started writing to uh, the GPs of my patients saying, can you please explore the opportunity, this amazing opportunity to put our patients type 2 diabetes into remission using a low carb or ketogenic diet, what we call therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. And I started working with a nutritionist in Adelaide, Rochelle Martin, and I now have over a dozen patients who put their type 2 diabetes into remission. One of these was Bevan Bruce, who very quickly came off his insulin. He's now off all his medicines, lost a bunch of weight, feeling amazing, and is actually seeing better. Now, let's go back to that endothelial glycocalyx. Now, if high blood glucose causes damage, then maybe lowering blood glucose could allow recovery of the glycocalyx. And well, yes, we know that that can happen. In fact, it can happen within hours to days. But can it result in reduction in leakage from those damaged blood vessels? 
Well, let's return to ophthalmology and the retina to see whether that's the case. We know that reducing carbohydrate intake is the best way to reduce blood glucose naturally. So will a reduction in carbohydrates allow a reduction in diabetic macular edema? Well, as it turns out, it can. I now have 16 patients who have been undergoing uh, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, and in every single one of them, I've seen a reduction in diabetic macular edema. This is super exciting. I presented it on the weekend to a group of ophthalmologists for the first time. I don't think it's ever been reported before, and I'm just about to publish this series. Now, for those of you who are interested, um, and I think you all should be, uh, if you're wanting a nutritionist or a dietitian, Low Carb Down Under has an excellent directory. We actually have a Low Carb Down South uh, Facebook group for those of you who, who'd like to be a part of that. Uh, it's specifically for South Australia. Uh, if you want to give it a go yourself, then the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners have released clinical guidelines, which are excellent. Even the American Diabetes Association now has given us uh, a guide for healthcare providers. So lots of resources out there. And for patients, uh, Defeat Diabetes is a subscriber app created by physician Peter Bruckner, which is specific for Australia. I would also highly recommend that. And uh, you know, for our patients with type 2 diabetes, um, CGM is an excellent way for them to see the impact of various foods on their bodies. And something I'd also recommend that you also do yourselves. Now, going back to complications of type 2 diabetes, Neil Hansel, when he was diagnosed at the age of 26, he had no idea what was in store for him. In fact, just last week, I had a patient with type 2. She'd been diagnosed five years ago, came to see an ophthalmologist or an optometrist for the first time, had no idea that she was at risk of loss of vision. So I created a couple of TV commercials using Neil Hansel and his really powerful story. Uh, and this is one that I created uh, during the pandemic last year. So I'll just play that to you just to finish off. So as an ophthalmologist, I never want to see another patient, another fellow human go needlessly blind due to their diabetes, particularly their type 2 diabetes. And as healthcare practitioners, as leaders in our society, in our country, I think we have a duty to offer this amazing opportunity to patients with type 2 diabetes to ultimately, be, ultimately make Australia type 2 free. Thank you very much. And for those of you who are interested in, in uh, following the work, of my not-for-profit site for all. Uh, there's some hashtags there. For those of you who are interested in my work as Australian of the Year and beyond, uh, then there's some hashtags there which I can share later. So I'll stop um, presenting now. Uh, I'll hand back the, uh, the controls to Paul. And thank you all again for uh, being a part of this grand round. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. James Mewke. Uh, uh, we only have a very short time for questions. Can I ask you one to start with, James? Uh, what do you see the implications of your uh, your study uh, on the food that we provide our patients in our hospitals and perhaps also provide uh, for ourselves in our cafeterias and other food sources inside our own system? Yeah, this is the whole accountability, eh, Paul? And I have a whole presentation about that, which I'm happy to come back and give to the group, but that's another half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, but uh, I've written to all of the hospitals in South Australia, pleading with them to remove the, the, the junk food from uh, from the vending machines and also to consider removing the sugary drinks from the cafeterias. And, and uh, so far, uh, not much in the way of luck, a little bit of luck with the vending machines. Uh, in WA, they actually remove sugary drinks uh, from all the hospitals in the state, uh, but it's just one tiny little piece of the puzzle. There's a, there's a multi-pronged approach here, and it's only uh, when we actually embrace every element of it that we're actually going to turn this epidemic around. Thank you. Well, uh, there's a challenge there. Uh, there is uh, uh, Sharon, uh, you have your hand up for a question. 
Hi, James. It's Sharon uh, Wingard here. I'm the Director of Aboriginal Health, and you've inspired me. You've only been on this platform for a few minutes with you, but I'm very excited to hear some of the um, things that are happening, and it backs up some of the work Paul and I are trying to do in the Aboriginal communities, and uh, it is important that uh, we hear differences uh, compared to what we've been taught in our past. So um, from the Aboriginal communities, you know, this is something that we're going to take on board. And I think the one of the biggest things is about who's talking about this? It seems to be silenced in mainstream media. Um, and obviously there's um, political gains in anything that we do, but um, it's really important that um, our communities realise this is reversible. We've never been told that before, and it's so, so exciting. So thank you for your time today. Oh, you're welcome, Sharon. Thank you for your comments as well. It, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And I was uh, just a couple of weeks ago up at the Gama Festival in Arnhem Land, and it was just staggering the amount of type two diabetes. And I, the fact that it's it's reversible, certainly preventable. There's so many, so much work that needs to be done here. But in terms of patients that might be looking for some inspiration, uh, Ray Kelly, I was involved in Michael Mosley's documentary at the end of last year, Australia's Health Revolution. Uh, Ray Kelly is, a, is an exercise physiologist who's doing remarkable things with his patients. So highly recommend uh, reaching out to him as well. Well, I think on that basis, we uh, should uh, draw this to a, uh, to a close. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. James Mickey. Thank you everybody for being part of this. Uh, it's our opportunity as an academy and as an LHN uh, to be challenged, uh, to challenge the status quo, to challenge ourselves and to, uh, to move forward, uh, making this a better place for our communities and a better place for us to work. Uh, I think uh, you've given us a lot to think about uh, today and it's now up to us uh, to take the next steps. Uh, we also now know where you live uh, and who you are, so there's the opportunity for further conversations. And as uh, Sharon indicated, we're about to start uh, some work uh, in the LHN based on this, which uh, Dr. James Mewkey has been part of inspiring us to do. So thank you very much. And uh, in uh, Nut and Jerry language, uh, we say to everyone, uh, Thank you. Goodbye, Nakam. No, thank you, Paul, and thanks everyone for joining in once again. And uh, happy for anyone to reach out to me. Uh, I've raced through the presentation today. I'm sorry it was a bit speedy, but I think there was a recording there, so people can turn turn the uh, the speed down and, and listen to it at a better, <laughs> a less a less pacey uh, rendition. So uh, I wish all the best. But uh, I'm here if anyone wants to ask me any questions. Uh, Paul can share my email address, and wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who can hear the music uh, that we play at these grand rounds, it's actually a tribute to Professor Fred Hollows by the Gregorian Brothers. Uh, so I thought it was worth uh, just letting people know that uh, because, of course, his work was uh, like yours, uh, uh, trying to, uh, to stem the affliction of uh, blindness. And now we have a way of preventing it. So thank you, everybody.